you have a Bible, um, you want to turn it to John. <clears throat> if you don't have a Bible, you can, uh, obviously, if you have one on your phone, or there's a Bible on the pew rack in front of you, and the page number is listed there. We're going to be in John chapter 13. It's the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll be reading different verses out of chapter 13. <clears throat> So um, this morning, what I want to do is I want to kind of open up with a little bit of an English lesson. And I, I'm sorry, not everyone's going to be able to see this, but I'll try to get as many of you can to see it. Um, and I want to apologize uh, in advance to those of you who are teachers, especially if you're an English teacher uh, at any level, uh, because there's a good chance that I may not describe this correctly or whatever, and English isn't really a good a good language for me anyway. <laughs> I, I don't speak well, so, uh, so just bear with me. Um, that's a funny thing too, bear with me. Is that an, for those of you that know, is that an idiom? Because it just sounds like, hey, there's an animal with me, bear with me, I, I don't know. Or maybe that's not how you spell it. Is that how you, do you spell it B-A? Whatever, let's move on. So I'm going to try to teach you some English today. So this morning I want to tell you about suffixes. Anyone know what a suffix is in English? few people? Okay, it's okay to be proud of that. You know, we want you to know that you know what that is. So, according to GrammarMonster.com, which I'm sure is a reliable source that most educators go to, um, it says a suffix is a letter or a group of letters added to the end of a word to change its meaning or to ensure that it fits grammatically into a sentence. For example, when you add uh, the suffix O-U-S to the word joy, it goes from a noun to being an adjective, joyous, right? That's a, what a suffix does. Another example is, uh, another suffix is S. And sometimes you have to add an S to a word to, so that it'll, it'll fit grammatically, it'll be correct. So you wouldn't say, Jimmy never exercise. No one would ever tell me that. Jimmy, but, but when you add an S, you say, Jimmy never exercises, then that becomes correct. And it also becomes very true. Um, <laughs> and so adding the S, so... That, that's, there's some examples of suffixes. And by the way, if, if you are homeschooling, I want you to know that this English lesson counts for this week, kids, so you're welcome. Uh, but anyway, so I want to talk about a word, and the word that I want to uh, talk about today is the word self. I don't know if everyone can see that. It, even if you can't, it doesn't really matter. You can just imagine it. Now, um, and so we're going to talk about, talk about self, and we're going to look at two, two suffixes to this word. And the first one is this one. What does that say? Ish. That's right. Okay, that's the first suffix we're going to talk about. So um, now when you add ish, it, it makes this rather self, it just makes this rather harmless word into something that's really not so harmless. Um, selfish is, is not a good word. Matter of fact, the definition of that, that little uh, suffix, I-S-H, when you add it to a word, it's usually mean tending toward or preoccupied with, as in selfish. So when, when you are ish, then you are, you are tending towards or preoccupied with, with that. So, so selfish, that is, that is not that is not good. And we all, we probably all know someone who we would describe as self-ish. Um, and who knows, maybe somebody's thinking about you when they, when they think about that word. But selfishness is not a good thing. It, it, it destroys relationships. Why? Because it's, it, when you're selfish, it's all about you. It's just all about what, what you're about. You're numero uno in your life. Um, selfishness means that you take care of you at all costs. Selfish means that I'm listening to you, but I wish you'd really hurry up and stop talking because I want to talk now. I want to tell you all about my world and my life. Uh, selfish is, is always trying to want, well, you think you've had a bad day. Listen to my bad day. Well, you know, I just had knee surgery. Well, oh yeah, well, I had knee and elbow surgery. You know, it's just always one. You just, it's always got to be about you. Um, selfishness is, is, is throwing a fit or, or making an excuse or acting like you've been stricken with some kind of illness every time someone asks you to do something or, or, or asks you to be involved with something that maybe is not, it, maybe it's out of your comfort zone or you just don't feel like it or it's just, you know, you just, you're just like, I don't want to do it because I'm selfish. Selfish is living like God created the world for you. 
um, for your pleasure, for your glory. And, and, and bottom line, selfish, selfish ain't good. And my apologies, English teachers, but it ain't. It ain't good. Now, watch this. You take this, you change the ish, and you add that. What does that say? Less, less. So you change the ish to less, and you have a completely different word. You have the, actually, you have the exact opposite of selfish. Where, where ish means that, that there's a preoccupation with self, less is a preoccupation with others. It's not, it's not more of you, but it's, it's less, less of you. Selfless means that others are first. Selfless means you take, you take care of others. Selfless means that, that I'm listening to you, and I really do want to understand you. I'm not, I'm not rushing to judgment. I'm not rushing to try to say what I want to say or to argue with you. I just really want to understand. Selfless means saying, you know, wow, you've had a bad day. What can I, what can I do for you? Selfless means helping when you, when you can without the moaning and groaning and the complaining, without always having to be asked, even, even when it's not going the way that you think it should go or the way that you want it to go. Selfless is understanding that our lives were created by God for God, and for His glory. And that's, that's the model that Jesus gave us, and that's, that's what we're going to read about today in, in John chapter 13. And hopefully you'll learn some things that we can apply uh, to our lives. But here's the deal. Our tendency, all of us, me included, our tendency is to be ish people. That's our tendency. That's, that's the sin nature in us, is we want to be preoccupied or, or tend to lean to to ish. But here's the deal. In order to be what God created us to be, we need to be less ish and more less. More less. So let's, let's read, and, 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 and we're going to read about Jesus' example in this. So we're going to be in, in John chapter 13. We're going to read uh, some different verses, so follow along with me. John chapter 13. Verse 1, it says, before the Passover festival, let me, let me set this up. So Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's actually about to be arrested. Um, he's having his, the last meal, the Passover meal with, with his disciples. He's going to be betrayed by Judas, and Judas is going to go and set in motion the arrest and, and, and the execution of Jesus. And so this is right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's going to be praying for his life, and, but not my will, Father, yours. And then after that, he's arrested, he's taken, he's, he's experienced two trials that, that were illegal. He, he, falls, he, he gets beaten, he gets humiliated, and ultimately he's killed on the cross. So this is right before all of that is about to happen. So before the Passover festival, Jesus knew, here he's, he's telling you, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon's, uh, to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. And Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel and tied, it, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. Uh, he says, you will, Peter says, you will never wash my feet. Jesus says, Simon Peter, Lord... Uh, Simon Peter, Jesus replied to him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who, betray, for he knew who would betray him. And this is why he said, not all of you are clean. Verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, just as I have done for you. Skip over to verse 31. It says, when he had left, and that's talking about Judas, who was betraying him. When he had left, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. 
Children, I am with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. And just a side note there, Jesus is not saying, I'm going to heaven and you can't come with me. Jesus is saying, I'm about to go to the cross, and I'm about to pay for the sins of the world, something that they couldn't do because they were not perfect. They were not sinless. Only Jesus was. So where I am going, you cannot come. Verse 34, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So in reading that whole passage, the phrase that sticks out to me in that is is the phrase that Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands. And so to hear that, I'm... everything. So Jesus, this speaks to to the amazing power, this awesome power that Jesus has, but it also speaks to to an amazing love that he had. You see, because at any moment in time, Jesus was had the ability to stop what was about to come. The the arrest, the uh, the trial, the the beatings, the torture, the cross, at any moment he could have said done finished. No, we don't want any part of that. But, but he also had an amazing love. And Jesus was not surprised by this moment. This was God. This was God's plan from the very beginning. This was Jesus. This was his mission. He had the power to make it all go away, but he also had the love for his father and the trust for his father and for his plan so that he would go and endure the cross so that, that we wouldn't have to. Imagine that. The power to make it all go away, but yet the love to still follow through. That's, that's selfless. That's selfless. And it's in that context that we get this new command. And the new command is not love each other better. It is to love each other the way Christ loved us. Not better, but to love us the way that Christ loved us. And to love as Christ loved means that we can't be, we can't be ish people. We have to be less we have, to, we have to empty ourselves. You see, if, if Jesus has any other agenda in mind, then the cross doesn't happen. He empties himself of his own desires and chooses to follow the desires of, of his Father. He loved perfectly, and that's, that's exactly what he's calling you and me to do, is to love perfectly. 1 Corinthians is, is a great definition. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 7, it's a great definition of God's love for us and the love that he wants us to have with one another. It says love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it's happy with the truth. Excuse me. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things. It endures all things. Now, some of you may be thinking, yeah, right. You're right. No, no, no way, Jose. No, that, that's impossible. Nobody, nobody loves that way. Nobody loves that way. And I would say you're right. I would say no one on their own can love that way. That's why I said we're not supposed to try to love each other better because better implies that we're just trying harder. And if we're already incapable of loving the way that God asks us to love, then trying harder isn't going to do much at all. So it's, it's not trying harder. We're supposed to love as Christ loved. And the only way that that's accomplished is through the Holy Spirit's work in our life. You've probably heard this phrase, maybe if you've grown up in church or you've been around church a while. Uh, but, I, and it's an old, but it's important to remember that God is not going to ask you to do something that he's not going to equip you to do. So if God says, this is how I want you to love, then guess what he's going to do? He's going to equip you in order to love that way. Now, any of you here good at working on cars? Raise your hand if you're good at working on cars. There's one, two. Good, we have two people, so, or three. We're in trouble. Uh, we need more mechanics in here. Come on. Um, so here's the deal. I am not. I am not good at working on cars. There's not much I, I am good at, but especially not working on cars. But here's what I do, because, you know, I'm a man. So I, I, uh, I don't know why I sniff like that. I think, is that what men do? We sniff like that. So I'm, I'm a man. And so what I do is I, I, when, when there's a problem, I go to where you're supposed to go, to the, to the front. And what do you do? You, you pop the hood. 
So, you know, I go to the owner's manual. How do you pop the hood? And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you pop the hood and you open it up and you just look. And so I'm, I'm looking, you know, and I'm, I'm you know, kind of thumping on things like it's a watermelon, making sure not to touch what's, what's not hot. But here's the deal. I have no idea what I'm looking at. No idea what, what the problem is. No idea um, what, what to do. I don't even, I couldn't really even name you the parts. But, a, but here's the deal. When a mechanic or someone who knows what they're doing, here's the deal. They see the exact same thing I do. They see the same parts. They see the same trouble. They see it all. But here's what they know that I don't. They know what problems are. They see the problem and they see solutions. They're, they're equipped they know how to do it. They know what they're supposed to do, what not supposed to do. They, they, they have all, all of that here, okay? And it's something that they, they have the training, they have the perspective, they have the skill, they have the ability. Guess what God has? God has perspective. He has power. He has wisdom. He has exactly what we need in order to love the way that he's called us to love, in order to live the way that he's called us to live. And here's the best part. He wants to give that to you and to me. You see, God knows that for us to, be, to live a selfless life, then they, we, can't, we can't be ish people. It has to be less ish and more less so that we can be what God has called us to be. So when, so when Jesus says, love as I loved you, that means he's going to develop in you the very things that you need to love like he loves. But here's the deal. You've got to let him work in you and not choose to ignore his work in, in your life. You've got to be selfless, not selfish. And, and I think it's so great that Jesus says, do what I did. He doesn't say, do what I've never done or do what I'm not willing to do. See, the love that we've been commanded to give is a response to the love that we've already been given. It's a response to the love that he's already given, that he's already displayed for us. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Jesus being the good shepherd. You see, Jesus initiates this relationship. He goes first. He showed us how to love, and he's about to give love's ultimate expression in John 13. He's about to go to the cross and show us love's greatest expression. In fact, in 1 John 4, 9 through 10, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. He, he modeled it. He gave it. And now what he wants us to do is he wants us to pass it on. And you know what a huge, a huge difference between selfish and selfless people is? It's our willingness to either be a, a thoroughfare, selfless, or a roadblock, selfish. And you think about, think about your arteries in, uh, that are in your body, okay? So w- when working properly, the blood flows from your heart through your arteries to the rest of the body. But what happens when one of those arteries gets blocked? Bad, right? Not good. Bad. And so our, our bodies don't work like they should, and, and really it, it can lead to major, major damage for us. And here's the deal. Selfishness obstructs the flow of Christ's love into the rest of the world. Christ's body doesn't work like it should when Christ's followers are obstructing the love of God. We want, here's the deal, we want to be blessed. God, you please bless me, bless me. But we forget that we're blessed so that we could be a blessing to someone else. We want, we want church to be exactly like the way I, I, want, I want my church to be, to fit me and to be exactly the way I want it. But we forget that church is also for people who aren't here yet. We want Jesus' salvation and forgiveness. And it's good that we want that. But we forget that there's a world right outside of our doors who need God's salvation and forgiveness too. We, we, we champion things like we, we want to be pro-life, and I think we should be pro-life, but we forget, too, that there are thousands and thousands of orphans and kids who are waiting for families. We want God to take care of us, but we forget that there's people who are suffering because they don't have the basic needs of life. And I'm not talking about in third world countries. I'm talking about right here in Collin County. You see, we want, we want, we want, and that's, that's selfishness. And here's what we say, what a, what a tragedy 
for someone to ignore the love of God. And that is a tragedy. That is so sad when someone would ignore the love of God. But here's another tragedy. When someone is unwilling to pass on the love of God or to allow God to to work through them to use their time, their talents, their treasures, their abilities. It was shared with you. Why, Why wouldn't you pass it on? Why would you hoard the things of God? And I know, I know we love to say, Jesus died for me. And yes, he did. He died, he died for you. He died for me. And, but, but maybe we should say, to help us to, to stay away from this ish attitude, we need to say that Jesus died for the world. We, he died for the world. And, I, and I'm a small part of it, but I'm going to make sure that I do my part so that the world will know that Jesus died for them and that, the wor- and that Jesus loves them. And you can do that in any number of ways through different ministries here at our church. If you're not involved in a ministry, there's, there's tons of ministries that you can do here and you can be a part of that God will use to, use to, to, to kind of funnel his love and blessings towards other people. You just have to say yes to him. But not just in this church, but also you can do that outside of this church. through The people that God has placed in your life at work, at home, in your neighborhood, in school, on your teams. You see, Ish... Ish people, it's just me. Less people are saying, God, how do you want to use me to impact the world that's around me? We're called to be thoroughfares where things are moving, not roadblocks. And remember, God's God's love became flesh in Jesus. Now, Jesus' love now becomes flesh through us, through the church. It's another old saying, but it's true. We are the hands and feet of Christ. We are his ambassadors. We are his representatives. We are, we are his temple. And, and here's a scary thought, okay? A lot of people form an opinion about God based on how they see us living. Do you know that? A lot of people base their opinion on God based on how they see you and me as Christ followers. They see us living. And we, some of us, and we have to work doubly hard sometimes because we have some horrible examples of Christ being displayed by people who call themselves Christians. So it's, it's a job that's made even harder. But Jesus said that that's how it was going to happen. Um, and, and, but did you catch how, how he said people would know that we belong to him? It wasn't going to be through, through uh, he didn't say it was going to be through your, through your church building. He didn't say it was going to be through your church programs. He didn't say it was going to be through, through some, you know, through your great preaching sermons or your great music and all those are wonderful but you notice how he said that they would know that you belong to him he says it's how we love one another how we love each other he said they would know you're my disciples they will know you're my followers they will know you're my ambassadors they will know you're my representatives by how you love and treat one another galatians 5 13 14 says you my brothers and sisters were called to be free But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul is talking to the church. And he's saying, this is what you need to do with your freedom. Your freedom is to love one another humbly. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know who are some of the most critical people, some of the most judgmental people, some of the most hurtful people in the world? You know who they are? Some of them are Christians. People that they would say were Christ followers. You know what you shouldn't feel when you walk into this place? You shouldn't feel judgment. You shouldn't feel looked down upon. You shouldn't feel less than. You shouldn't feel like you don't belong. You shouldn't feel those things because Jesus says the way that we're to love one another is to love the way that he loved us. Can you imagine a, a church filled with people um, who, who are welcoming, people who, who are willing to accept one another, people who who say, you know what, it's okay not to be okay, where, where, where someone walks into this place, and because of the people that are in this place, they, they feel needed, they feel loved, they feel apart. And then can you imagine those same people in this church walking out of this church into their worlds and doing the same thing, still making sure people feel loved and feel accepted and feel heard and feel valued. Jesus said, you've got to love each other well and then love the world well. 
And guess what happens when we love the way that we've been loved and the way that God calls us to love? People, people want some of it. They want it. Because you know what people are looking for? People are looking for a place to belong. People are looking for a place to feel a part of something. People are looking for a place to find purpose. People are looking for a place to find hope, to feel love. That's what our world is looking for, and they're looking for it everywhere. But God says, you are the church. This is where it's found. It's found. The church is the hope of the world. And we can't be the hope of the world if we're ish people. We got to be more, more or less than more ish. When we love that way, when we love each other that way, God says people are going to want some of that. That's cool because they don't see that anywhere else. They don't get that anywhere else. No one treats them like they do. Um, they, they look at us and say, hey, there's something different about them, something different about their marriages, something different about their families. They're not perfect, but there's a joy there that, that I don't see anywhere else. There's a peace there that I don't see anywhere else. They, they, they serve like no one I've ever... They, they're always the first people to come. They're always the first people to talk to me. They're always the first people to pray for me. They're always, they're always there, and it's, I, I don't get it, but I like it, and I want it. The love, the love we have for each other identifies us as Christ's followers and it also is a witness to people who don't know Christ. You see, the love that we have for each other is an identity, but it's also a witness to tell the world about our God. And you know a super simple way to start this? Super, super simple way. I told it to the kids, I'll tell you. Encourage one another. Easy peasy. Encourage one another. Speak encouragement and support into each other's lives. Make a point to be a light in someone's life. And let's practice here with each other so that we can be good at it, but then also so we can not only be good in here, but also we want to be good out there. Because again, when we're good at it with one another, people out there will see that and they'll want to be a part of it. Because here's what I know. The world doesn't need more grumpy people. The world doesn't need more opinionated people. The world doesn't need more moody people. The world doesn't need more critical people. The world doesn't need more hurtful people. The world doesn't need more sarcastic people. You know what the world needs? The world needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus, and Jesus has called us to be Jesus to this world. And we can't be Jesus if we're stuck in ish. Less ish and more less. But I want to tell you something. It's impossible to love as Christ loved if Christ is not your first love. It's impossible to love like Christ loved if Christ is not your first love. Back in verse 32 in there, uh, in John 13, it says, If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify Him at once. And that's really sounds kind of confusing, but you, this commentary, I love this commentary uh, quote about that. It says, The word for exalt or glorify actually means to lift up on high. For Jesus, His glory will, in, will involve His being lifted up on high on the cross out of love for us and in, and in obedience to God. And He will bring the Father glory. So Jesus will be glorified, but He's also going to bring the Father glory by fulfilling the Father's plan to bring us out of bondage to sin and death through His death, burial, and resurrection. You see, Jesus, His one focus, His one mission, His one desire for His life, His first love was to do the will of His Father. He wanted to please His heavenly Father. He wasn't living for the opinion of man. He wasn't trying to be a crowd pleaser. No, he, wasn't, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a jerk, but He wasn't trying to be a cloud. He wasn't looking for popularity. He wasn't looking for recognition. Matter of fact, a lot of people who came to Jesus just went the other way. So He wasn't living for them. You see, Jesus loved His Father, and it was that love for His Father that He was willingly going to the cross to give us victory over sin and the grave. And see, I, 
And, and it was his love for his father that, that led him to love the way that he did. And our tendency as, as selfish people is to have a divided heart. And, and if you know, you know relationships, um, a divided heart is not good. You see, you, a lot of us go, God, you, you can't mean all. Like, you want all my life, all my heart. That, that's, that's unreasonable. But we know that when you have a divided heart, a, a divided heart, what it can do to marriages. A divided heart, what it can do to families. A divided heart, what it can do to friendships and relationships. Because when you have a divided heart, that means someone is being cheated. If your heart's divided in your marriage, then, you're, then your spouse doesn't have all of you. If, if your divided heart in a family, that means your family doesn't have all of you. And you know that a divided heart destroys those relationships. But here's the beauty of a heart that's completely surrendered to God. He then gives us the ability to love others as well. But we won't love like Jesus told us to love if Jesus isn't our first love. I, I used to say in, in student ministry that, you know, we, a lot of times we put Jesus on a, a priority list. And what are, what are your priorities? Well, God's my priority. And then, then they would say, you know, my family, then school, and on and on and on. And I think that's great. But the problem, the problem, you probably heard me say this, the problem with priorities is they change. So our priority right now, hopefully, is to be in here and listen to this. Now, if you see a giant fire coming out of here, your priority is no longer to sit here and listen to me. It's to get out of here, right? Same way in life. Right now, my priority is God. This is my important thing. Oh, no, things aren't good at work. Well, ugh, it's going to shift over here, and our priorities change. So when I say that Jesus needs to be our first love, what that means is that our life is built upon him. He's the foundation. He's the first thing. Whenever you build something, right, it's the groundwork. It's the foundation that you do first, and then everything, everything is done after that. And the success or the failure of your building or your house or whatever is based on your foundation. And the success and failure of our lives is based on our foundation. And we need to have our foundation in Jesus. He needs to be our first love. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit, that's a, a, the fruit of a life that is surrendered to Him, that is not divided, but is completely given over to God. The fruit of a life that has, that has Jesus as His first love is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You see, it is a love that is empowered By the Holy Spirit. It's a love that means to love unconditionally and sacrificially as God Himself loves us, sinful people, and the way that He loves His Son. And this isn't a love that we generate on our own, and it's not a love that we get from anyone else or or anywhere else. It's only a love that comes from a heart that is completely surrendered to God. And I love this quote uh, from a devotional that, that a friend of mine shared with me this week. Here's a quote. It says, We can live our lives in obedience to God's command to love others for one reason alone. Our Heavenly Father is near, alive, and active in us. The same God who empowered Paul, Peter, John, Stephen, David, Daniel, and Esther lives in us today. Um, the, the devotional quotes Romans 8, 11. It says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit who dwells in within us as believers is love. We can love like Jesus because His Spirit longs to produce the fruit of love deep within us. He longs to love people through us and He has a perfect plan to use you to reveal to a broken and searching world the unfathomable riches of Jesus' love. We can't love like God asked us to love if our first love is ourselves. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If our first love is us, then what we've become is we become a roadblock. If our first love is us, 
And what we've done is we're hurting our witness. If, we, if our first love is us, then what we're doing is making our church um, ineffective. Less ish, more less. If we want to love like Jesus called us to love, then we can't be selfish people. We have to be selfless.